Okay, well, first of all, thank you for coming. Uh, I thought you had enough of me for those who were watching that's on television. Um, today, uh, I'm going to speak about uh, a lot of uh, successful bugs. And from a microbiologist's point of view, a successful bug is the one that uh, managed to create pandemics. There are a lot, a lot of microbes out there. We have more bacteria in our human body. Sorry, I have a beard and I think this has some impact on the microphone. We have more bacteria in the, our human body than we have the human cells. And for each of these bacteria, there are a multitude of viruses also, that, which whom we live in symbiosis every day. And for some reason, sometimes, and not very often, the humankind comes into contact with um, a new pathogen, a bacteria, a virus. And for some reason, this pathogen is uh, pathogenic enough to provoke a disease, to provoke death, but not too pathogenic. Because when you're too pathogenic, then people die directly, and the outbreak will stop very rapidly. And this is the reason why I'm not going to speak a lot about Ebola, even if Ebola has created these last years more and more big outbreaks. Um, they are always nearly self-limiting. Like, these diseases tend to have an end, even if it happens after a few months and after so many deaths. Why? Because uh, without any medical intervention, apart from intensive care and so on, but we don't have uh, vaccines or good uh, antiviral drugs, the disease will stop by itself because uh, people will be afraid of sick people, create distances, create social distancing, adapt they, their behaviors uh, in order to uh, allow this disease to, to stop. So I'm going to speak about a couple of infectious diseases uh, which have been successful. And the, and the most successful one, uh, I don't know if the slides are working now, uh, and the most... No? The most successful one is actually a bacteria. It's not a virus. It's caused by a bacteria called Yersinia pestis. And uh, this bacteria, actually, when it started creating... Sorry. Pandemics. The name of these pandemics are the plague. Uh, people didn't know a clue about this bacteria. We didn't have any microscope, we didn't even know microbes existed. So we gave names to diseases because of, uh, of what they meant to people. And you, when you still today, while this disease has nearly disappeared, uh, the plague is still a word that impacts a lot the mind uh, of people. The first plague pandemic happened about 1,500 years ago. Actually, it started probably in, in Africa, in the Rift Valley, then went to Constantinople. At that time, Constantinople was, Constantinople was the, the Wuhan, a place with, with a lot of uh, travels, uh, of economical activity delivering all the Mediterranean ports. And so at that time, uh, there has been an outbreak which uh, has actually killed 50, uh, uh, 30 to 50 million people. And even if this looks very big, at that time it was even a much more significant uh, uh, number because it represented about half of the world population. At that time, nobody knew uh, what was going on. And the only thing that helped people to survive was, on one side, stigmatization of sick people, because these people had uh, buboes. So I'm going to show a picture a little bit later. So people could recognize sick people. They would die and so on. So the stigmatization created this physical distancing. And then the other tool that was used and of which we, we, we also uh, uh, hear a lot these days, was herd immunity. 
when half of the people were killed, the other half was immunized. And so people could co continue and, and, and the pandemic, uh, this episode of the pandemic was over. Then about 800 years later, the Black Death, once again, the same plague came back. And this time, it took the life of about 200 million people, so four times more. And it went through the whole of Europe. It had a lot uh, of consequences on the economy, on social activities. Uh, and at that time, one of the main ways that uh, cities actually prevented the disease to come in was to put people who arrived in quarantine. I don't know if you make any parallel with what's going on now. So this was a long, long time ago, this notion of quarantine, which was actually initially more 30 days, but then because they wanted to be safer, they extended the duration of quarantine. So they went from 30 to 40, and this is uh, the, the, the wording. Now these days, we don't really extend quarantine, we, we try to to decrease the time, which also comes with a risk. So the pictures of these days uh, are, are horrific. This is what uh, was in the mind of people. People were dying in the streets, and uh, mass graves happened. And uh, one particular city, which seemed to be, to be very vulnerable to this outbreak, uh, was the plague was London. And along the years, from 1,300 uh, to 1,600, 700, so 300 years during which London was exposed every 10 years to a huge outbreak of plague. And at that time, well, it was quite interesting to see because it's the first time that people started reporting death. And you know, numbers, reporting, open data, it's a, it's a very important thing these days. And so people started uh, reporting death. And what was really impressive, too, in London is that uh, they imposed other measures. They stopped uh, all social activities. Uh, they, they, stopped, they, they asked people who were sick to, re, uh, to remain in their houses and to really be careful when they had to go out for shopping uh, to carry something which, which would clearly distinguish them as being potentially infected if they were part of a household with a, a contaminated case. So you see that all these approaches to try to combat uh, the plague pandemics were totally non-pharmaceutical. And actually, we didn't even have a clue of uh, the cause of the disease. And the cause of the disease is this bacteria, which uh, you can see if you look in a microscope, in these bubos, these are lymph nodes which explode, and which are very infectious, which carry a lot of bacteria. These bacteria act were actually discovered many, many years uh, later. And so, when you look at this example of London, where you, you see that they have been with repeated exposure to the... Uh, to the disease. And this is where kind of thinking about epidemic preparedness uh, arrived. What is important actually in a disease preparedness <coughs> is how you can uh, prevent or eventually or prepare uh, yourself to a disease to try to detect very early the signs of the outbreak coming. How can you identify that something is going on before it becomes a drama? And this period of time is, of course, very complex because if you identify these early signs, the community doesn't always uh, see them, see them and, and understand the, the reason why we should change our behaviors. And if you don't manage to do that, then comes the peak, inevitably, and, uh, and then you have no other means than try to mitigate the impact of, of this outbreak. How can you do that? You decrease transmission, stigmatization, social distancing, stopping uh, social events, and try to mitigate mortality through therapeutic care. But once again, uh, we are here in the context of an outbreak where there's no uh, antibiotic. And then you're, you're supposed to learn from experience. 
And normally you expect that along the way uh, there will be some uh, improvement. But actually what happened in London was that the, every 10 years there was a new outbreak and actually it was the last one which was the, the, the most important. So even if you learn, it doesn't mean that you can really manage, prevent. Um, and, and this is a very important uh, message to take. Then I'm going to go to a second very successful pandemic, which is the, flu, the Spanish flu. It's called Spanish, not know exactly why, uh, because uh, we don't know exactly where it started. Some people say it started in Kansas, in the US. Um, but here you see once again that uh, as soon as you put the name of a community, of a country, on a disease, then it stays for years and years and years. This epidemic uh, happened around the years 1918, uh, so during this, at the end of uh, the First World War. And here, once again, we have numbers. What do we see here? We have numbers from New York, London, Paris, Berlin, place to be. Um, so it was everywhere. And what we can see are three different waves. Interesting. Same kind of things that we hear about every day. Um, the first wave was probably very big for the people at the time they were speaking about the first wave. They, they were living it within the first wave. But the biggest one, the one who killed so many million people, was actually the second one. And uh, how did it happen? How did we go from one local outbreak, a flu, a new flu transmitted probably through uh, animals, to uh, a pandemic which uh, impacted so many people? How could it travel? Well super spreading events. You put so many soldiers on the boat for so many days to tr cross the Atlantic to come and help uh, European countries. And, um, and here you have time for transmission. Here, if there was one case on the boat where, on, on the point of departure, and well, they were probably all infected uh, when they arrived. And so this is all these movements of troops uh, actually where the planes of today, uh, they had some massive transmission all over the world, and this is uh, clearly uh, a very uh, important learning we had from that time. And what we had to, sorry, the picture is not so good, uh, is saturation of ICU beds. You see all these beds? Um, there were not enough staff, shortage of staff, also because of the context of the war, uh, there were uh, limited beds, there were no drugs to treat people, there were no vaccines. And so the only thing you could provide to people was some kind of palliative care, waiting for them to or die or recover. But this is also kind of the kind of environment where you also spread diseases from a patient to the other. If you entered there because you were sick and people thought you were infected with this uh, flu, um, Actually, if you weren't, you, you were going to be very soon. So, nosocomial transmission. This is also something that happened at that time, a lot. And it also happened in our context. In China, they were the first to report it in, for COVID. In Belgium, too, there were a lot, a lot of cases. While doctors, nurses, patients uh, had no masks or not enough masks, uh, well, this helped uh, in for transmission within the hospitals and the nursing homes, for example. And so, I spoke a little bit about antiviral drugs. So, in medicine, we speak about antibiotics. Usually, we we this is for bacteria, and then the antiviral drugs. And for antibiotics, we started discovering them. Uh, around the years 40, 50, with penicillin and so on. You probably heard about that. But for viruses, antiviral drugs, this was much more complex. Why? Because viruses are much more complex to study and, and to perform experiments. And actually, we only very recently started uh, approving uh, antiviral drugs. So there have been so many years in the history of humankind 
uh, during which we had uh, no drugs. And today we only have about 80, 90, a little bit more now, but uh, it is, uh, it's very, very limited. And certainly when you look at what these drugs do, uh, half of them actually are drugs against HIV. And then you have a number of them, and this is uh, from today, the, the Nobel Prize, Prize uh, was given to uh, people who have discovered anti-hepatitis C uh, virus drugs. So these are the brown ones. And then together with HCV, HCV H hepatitis B, CMV, influenza, influenza is the virus causing flu, uh, and you see that it's, this is the red bar, so there are not a lot, while it is a super important disease. Uh, you see that there, nearly, there is nearly nothing for all these viruses that you hear about. Zika virus, coronavirus, Ebola virus, Marburg, all these very, very pathogenic uh, viruses. Actually, we have nearly nothing, apart from a few experimental drugs for which we don't have a lot of information. So, what would have been the impact if, in 1918, we had these drugs against the, the flu, the pandemic flu. Well, some people have modeled that. Of course, we can no, not go back uh, in the history. But um, so the red waves are the ones that have occurred. You remember these from the, the previous slide. And the blue ones are the ones that uh, is the modeling of the impact of the pandemic if we had huge stockpiles of antiviral drugs. And you see that it's not super impressive. Instead of millions and millions, you would have millions and millions of deaths. Uh, the impact, uh, of course, is present, and certainly for the, for the big wave, uh, but um, it is not the magic bullet. So when people come to you with a magic bullets, a super solution, it usually uh, has, you, you need to manage expecta expectations. And this is, uh, what we would have had if we had a, a pandemic. Then one of the most important measures at that time um, were masks. And here everybody has a mask in this room. And sometimes, and certainly a lot of you ask yourselves, is it as we, are we overshooting and so on? But um, we learned from experience. And this dramatic experience of these pandemics uh, Tell us, and we are actually forgot in, in, in our collective uh, memory, how important these masks have been uh, to tackle the, the, the flu pandemic. And you had all these port posters all around, and then you had this risk assessment group uh, of advice and the Nas National Security Council telling them when you should and you should not wear a mask. So all these debates that we're having today, we can put them in a historical perspective about, yeah, this is exactly what they've been doing more than 100 years ago. Exactly, with the same debates. There were no social media, no Twitter and so on, but uh, still um, all these questions arise. Now, um, entering a chapter of tuberculosis, well, here the story is still going on. Uh, it's not a story of the past. It started thousands of years ago, uh, because Mycobacterium tuberculosis is a, is a bacteria which has co-evolved with the humankind. We have lineages in Mycobacterium tuberculosis bacteria which are specific for each continent, because from the common ancestor, from the Rift Valley, there was a distribution, and tuberculosis uh, has traveled with the, the big migrations of humankind. And so it is a very, very uh, old disease, but still, it, is, uh, it has an enormous impact. And so, two things about tuberculosis. The first one is that one of its early names was consumption. Consumption means a body which little by little becomes weaker and weaker. And then, after so many weeks and months, um, people die. So it's not a dramatic disease where you die from one day to the other, or after a few days like COVID or whatever. It is a disease which happens, which is very, very uh, slow in its progression, it's in its transmission. It has a huge inertia, 
And this is uh, certainly one of the uh, major difficulties in TB, and I'm going to discuss about that. And then TB is a little bit like flu, a little bit like COVID, uh, an airborne disease. It is a disease which is transmitted by the air. And you see that uh, most of the pandemics, um, and there are not so many, actually are airborne. Why? Because airborne transmission is super efficient, because if it's a disease which is transmitted from a human to a human, well, the only thing that we're quite sure we're going to do when someone we're going to meet, when we're going to meet him or her is to speak. Uh, and uh, even if it's because it's your friend or your enemy, you will uh, speak, and, and then there's this distance uh, which allows the droplets to, to, to spread. So wearing a mask, once again, for TB, is, uh, is a very efficient tool. But the problem with TB is that a quarter of the humankind is infected. Should one in four people in the world wear a mask indefinitely? 10 million people around the world uh, get sick of this disease every year. 1.5 million die every year. This is a huge amount of, of suffering. And some things were something that has to be mentioned, it's that it's a disease associated with poverty. Why? Because it, poverty is associated with so many uh, complex factors, promiscuity, lower access to health, lower access to education, all these tools uh, which normally come together and allow you to manage a complex health situation, well, uh, you don't have them in the context of poverty. And so, what makes tuberculosis very difficult is that when you're infected, it takes a few months or a few years or a few decades to develop eventually a disease. And so for years and years, you might have no symptom. The disease is, is in, in your lungs. It is not, not being expressed as a disease. The bacteria are not multiplying this, themselves enough to create an immune response, and all these little balls that you will find in the lungs of severely ill people. So the problem with tuberculosis is time. Time between the moment where you're infected and the moment where you develop disease, and then time between the moment where you develop disease and when you die. And this makes the, the concept of contact tracing, testing and tracing, very difficult. Why? Because in the context of COVID, we ask people, who have you met this last, this last week? And then uh, stay at home and it's going to be fine. But with someone who has TB, you have to ask the person, how, who have you met these last months? And this becomes very, very difficult. And so, if you don't allow people to have a rapid access to diagnosis, then these people will run around and seek care, seek help, and so on, have their, continue their jobs because they need their jobs, and they will transmit the disease and create uh, enormous outbreaks. So, because it's a disease related to poverty, it happens in poor countries, in poor communities of rich countries, and so on, well, there has not been a lot of efforts to develop super treatments. When you have TB, you get a package of four drugs that you need to take for six months, and it should be fine. And so we're not having an individualized treatment here. This means that sometimes it's not going to work. Sometimes the bacteria is going to mutate, and you're, and you're going to have the phenomenon of development of drug resistance. If you don't make sure that the drug you give works, then you will have an amplification of drug resistance because the patient is going to continue transmitting a drug resistance strain. And so along the way, the story of tuberculosis is developing one first antibiotic. Then it works for a couple of years. Then everything becomes resistant. Then we find another one and it's the same thing happening. And this is a reason why we treat people with four drugs at the same time. It's because the chance that they are resistant to the four drugs at the same time is very low. Well, it's very low, but it's not impossible. And when you have millions of patients every year, 
it always happens, and you know it's going to happen. And so, because we did not invest in good testing, individualized treatment, anti antibiograms, and so on, in these poor environments, because we did not make this initial effort of invent investing in quality of care, uh, now we're paying the price of another outbreak which goes on top of tuberculosis, which is multi-drug resistant tuberculosis transmission. And once again, this disease is even worse because you need sometimes to give 9 to 12 drugs every day to these patients for months and months and months. And so, this phenomenon of poverty uh, it, it is complex because poverty is on the one side the cause of the disease and on the, on the other side the consequence. Why the consequence? It's because when you have these people and these families, because the disease transmits within families, close contacts, well, because when you're sick, you cannot work, you seek care, and then you need to take medication for six months under a very paternalistic system, which tells you that you need to go to the health center in the middle of Africa, walk, walk every day five kilometers, sit there, wait for the nurse to tell you to, to have time and then take your pill in front of the nurse because they don't believe that they, you, you're, you can do it by yourself. And then go back home. You disrupt the whole microeconomy economy of a family and you plunge your family and your environment into a catastrophic situation where small costs accumulate in poor uh, environments. And then there's another element, which is multidrug resistance, where this resistance also creates huge costs in terms of treatment. The drugs that we need to use for, to treat multidrug resistant TB is thousands and thousands of dollars per patient. Something that countries cannot pay, that patients cannot pay. And so it creates a huge dependency on the international diplomacy. Uh, to provide these, um, these drugs. And actually, it's the community itself which, to provide these treatments to the patients, uh, decrease also its capacity to respond to other challenges. HIV and AIDS. Here it's not an airborne disease. Uh, I think everybody knows. Uh, sexually transmitted. So supposedly less infectious than airborne disease, but still, and uh, this is also about learning about human behaviors, it managed to become a huge pandemic. Every, every country is affected by, uh, with HIV. And here, once again, uh, the tools that we have, we can discuss them, but uh, they're, they're, they're quite difficult. And let me just mention Stigmatization. You remember we mentioned that for plague, it looked okay, but stigmatization creating distance. But here with HIV, you understand how stigmatization can be awful for the people who are infected, uh, and how much uh, specific groups of the community and so on have suffered so for so many years from this um, uh, stigmatization. HIV is transmitted sexually. It's also transmitted from mother to child during pregnancy or, or the early infancy. And we have now, every year, one to two million children who start their, their life with a virus, infected by a virus, that we cannot really treat. And this is also creates a huge burden, because on the, of course we can give them treatments, we're going to speak a little bit about that, uh, but we, we put them in a situation where their immune system is compromised from the very beginning, where they need to take drugs for their whole life, and where on top of that you add all this stigmatization, because a child who needs to take these drugs uh, is obviously the son of, and it creates a lot of uh, stigmatization and more difficulties for the child and its family. But let's go a little bit to the history. HIV, the, the history that, sorry, my bar, my beard, um, the history that we don't really uh, look at every day. Well, HIV is a virus which is specific to the human, 
which, which is very close to another virus specific for the monkey. And so such viruses, and they circulate a lot in the, in the animal world, and it's the case for so many viruses. The pool of viruses that is present in, 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 the, in the wild environment is huge. But of course, why, when the wild environment is, stays wild, it's fine, because there's a kind of relationship between the, the, the animals and, and the viruses and so on. The problem always comes when there's an accident in the history which puts these viruses in contact with the humankind. And of course, there are thousands of failed events of transmission, but the ones we remember are always the successes. And in the case of HIV, we know that uh, it has not been one event of transmission. It has been several, at least four or five. Uh, why do, how do we know that? Because when we look at the viruses which have uh, evolved in the humankind, well, they don't have the same uh, ancestor. Actually, they have an ancestor which is much older than happened uh, in, the, in the animal world. So, there has been a lot of, uh, several introductions of the virus in the humankind, and this happened probably in a country uh, that we uh, all know well, uh, in Congo. And then, it happened probably in the wildlife, in the rural areas, it went back uh, to the capital city, uh, Kinshasa, where there, probably for a number of years, there has been some amplification uh, of, the, uh, of the epidemic, because people were not sick. You know, it was HIV, you're not sick in the early days. Well, you can have a kind of, uh, of uh, severe disease in the very beginning, but then you can have years and years of normal life before you start having your, your opportunistic infections. And during all this period of time, well, in Kinshasa, it's, uh, yeah, uh, it was apparently a good environment to create this reservoir. And from there, from this capital city, it traveled to the world, including, and this is the well-known uh, impact through the movies and so on in, in the US, in specific communities, uh, men who have sex with men. And this is the environment where actually we discovered the existence and the severity of the disease. We also discovered the virus causing this disease. And how did we discover that? By all these people who had been sick for so many years and uh, were experiencing all these opportunistic infections, all these very bizarre diseases that usually you never find once in your career as a doctor. And here uh, there were so many cases. And so these patients uh, were diagnosed, and this syndrome of immunodeficiency was actually diagnosed years and years and years and years after the initial events where we could have intervened. So actually we were very late in our response, and this is a, a problem, a huge problem, because it allowed transmission uh, silently at the international level. And then, of course, what creates also some delays is this time you need to build your knowledge about a pathogen that you don't know. Learning to know something that didn't exist before is always a process which takes time, even when the mediatic pressure is very high. And so, here we're with HIV in a context still today where we have no antiviral which totally cures the disease. It allows to maintain the viral circulation in the human body to undetectable levels, but people need to keep on taking their pills every day for their whole life. So we were still uh, not yet there for therapeutic uh, treatment, even if we hear a few things and which maybe uh, will we'll change the history in, in a couple of years. But, and, and we are in a context where we don't have any vaccine yet. So, once again, we're in a context where we can only rely on non-medical interventions. Which are these ones? Well, a condom. A condom is not a medical intervention, but you know 
that it has taken a lot, a lot of debate in the society to allow, to accept the fact that people would use a condom. And when you have all these discussions today about a mask, well, you also remember what happened with the condom. And some people, because they had the truth, uh, have really mixed the message at that time. Uh, it was sometimes politically driven, sometimes by uh, religious uh, movements and so on and so on. And they always had their good reasons. But ultimately it had a lot of impact on the most vulnerable people for whom putting a condom was actually the only option. And this participated to the amplification of the outbreak. So th these controversies is something that uh, we uh, had a couple of decades ago. Now we say it's rubbish, we shouldn't have done that and so on, but we're repeating a history. There's another thing which is very important and also a parallel with today, uh, is the impact of people not diagnosed. If I am HIV infected and I multiply my high-risk uh, contacts, um, I am a danger if I don't know my status. From the moment that I know my diagnostic status, well, I can act on transmission. I can prevent tra transmission to hap happen. And, and, and the real problem is when people don't know. Why? Because they don't have access to diagnosis, because they're afraid of the diagnosis, and so on and so on. And, and today with COVID, it's totally different, but still, uh, spreading of the disease today is not related to people who know their status, because these people can act. It's before you get your diagnostic that you are infectious, because you are not motivated to follow the rules. You follow them, but as a non-infected person, not as an infected person. And this has a lot of impact. Um, and this is re the reason why uh, one of the strategies uh, made before HIV, for tuberculosis, for uh, COVID, is to try to let people know what is their individual status. And then one very important point with HIV, and the reason why HIV is now such a problem in sub-Saharan Africa, while it is getting more controlled in, in richer countries, is that they did not have access to the right tools in the same time as the others. And so you let the problem amplify uh, by delaying uh, access to therapeutics. And so access to health is not the same thing as having tools. And Tomorrow we're going to wake up in a world where we're going to have a vaccine and then we're going to have a, an, a debate about who should get this vaccine. And I can tell you that it's going to reveal humankind. So we're now entering a hot topic. Um, you know much more than me, <laughs> so it's going to be difficult to tell you more. Um, how did it start? It started with animals, reservoir of animals living in the wild. These bats are not supposed to be in contact with humankind. But these ones are dead, but uh, there was someone uh, who, who has been exposed to all these bats. And so there has been a lot of multiplied contacts with the wildlife. And then even if the virus could not transmit itself directly from the bat to the human, it may have happened, it's not yet clear. Well, if you put these bats in a market where you have all kinds of animals, you're going to have one which is susceptible. And who's going to play the intermediate, the number 10, the Eden Hazard of the team, and transmit to, uh, to the humans? And so here it happened again. A disease present in the wildlife, uh, virus present in the wildlife, wildlife in living in symbiosis with these animals, having adapted. And for that, bats are fantastic. Eh? Bats, actually, they eat uh, insects and their viruses every day. And so they have an immune system which is very permissive to viruses. They have a huge virome there. It's a fantastic world for virologists. And then... <laughs> You know, with China, you never know, do they downplay, do, you know, should we rely exactly on what they're saying? 
But actually, when you see that China is putting a mega city under lockdown and that it's building a huge hospital like this, I know it was live on YouTube, YouTube eh? you could see that they were, not, they were not wasting time. And that the next, they, and then after that, they put in the, into lockdown other cities, other me mega cities with all the impact that had, had, this has. Well, the signal that this virus was not a, a bad one uh, were, were clear enough. And this is when we started speaking about it in, in the Western countries, where we started all these discussions in the media, will it happen, will it not, we're ready, we're not, and so on, we have masks, no we don't. Um, but in between, uh, Wuhan uh, has a huge airport. And um, it's in the middle of all the connections uh, within China, but also with the external world. And when we're, we do some phylogeny, meaning looking at the genetic code of of the virus and how it evolves over time and through transmission event, events, well, we can see that Wuhan uh, was clearly the, the, the starting point of transmissions which went to so many different countries. And the first, the intermediate points were always the big airports connected with Wuhan, Paris, Gansu, Beijing, Shanghai, Frankfurt, Los Angeles, Singapore, Atlanta. All these, um, all these super hubs actually were the first one hit and then it spread uh, to others. So this was the first big channel of transmission. These were the boats of uh, the World War I. And actually, we don't know everything yet uh, and we don't know how much uh, this virus has impacted the world. There's a lot of debate about some countries. But these are, you know, when the numbers are small, when countries report small numbers, when you only have 10 COVID cases in one country for the last month, but you have satellite images which show mass uh, graves, um, of course, this has had a lot of impact. Uh, we, we know it well enough for our country there are still some unknowns for other countries. We tend to see that when the political powers are not strong enough or are very debated, at least, um, the response is usually weaker. Why? Because we only play here with non-medical interventions. The ones who are going to tell the people what to do are not the doctors, they're the politicians. Stopping bars, stopping uh, teachers, stopping whatever is not a medical decision in our world. It is a political decision. And when you have uh, places um, where the political power not even uh, say nothing, but says the contrary of what should be done, like in the US, like in Brazil, uh, then you have a huge amount of uh, of sick people and this. So I'm gonna go back to these uh, non-pharmaceutical, non-medical -med interventions and, and we know them. Lockdown, easy one, cheap one from a decision perspe perspective, enormous economical impact of course, but very efficient. You stop everything, then the virus stops spreading. How easy is that? And that was an easy one when we tried to manage the crisis. But of course, you cannot do that for long. So you need to, as soon as you have some air to breathe, try to find alternatives. First one is telling people, OK, move, but stay distant. Then you put a distance. How useful is it to put a distance? One meter, meter 50. Is the virus really going to stop at one meter 50? Of course not, it can go to 51, and maybe to 2 meters. But you need to put in the mind of people what kind of distance will decrease massively the risk. Not bringing you to risk zero, but bringing you to a risk where 
uh, it is much, much lower. And, and this, these kinds of decisions, once again, are totally arbitrary. Putting a distance is arbitrary. Because if you want to be safer, you tell five meters. If you want, if it, it gives you some opportunities to develop your, your cinema, then you will, you will say 75 centimeters and, and so on. But it's actually um, an arbitrary decision. And then when you cannot afford these distances, then you tell, okay, then here the risk is much higher. Okay, physical uh, barrier, use a mask. Uh, but using a mask, of course you need to have them first. Um, you need to use them where the, when they are necessary. You want to make sure that everybody has access to it. And so in the story of Belgium, this took some time. At, the ti at that time it looked a very long time. No masks, no masks, no masks. It was every day, um, the, the debate of every day. But once we had them, nobody wanted to wear them. And there's this notion of social bubble, social bubble. Um, do you know that in Belgium, before the crisis, the normal social bubble was 15 for the, for the young ones, and then 10 for adults, and five for old people. So when we brought everybody to five, it was really no effort for the old ones, but a massive effort for the younger ones, while the ones at risk were the ones doing very little effort. Okay, they did, but in comparison with their normal life, it was totally different. And when we pushed to 15, it was actually telling people do more than what you usually do. That was also a problem. And then I need to go fast because time has gone. Um, now, the idea of how we to manage this crisis is to, one concept is that to go from super spreading event to control transmission. There's no way we're gonna, no way we're gonna avoid transmission in the community. We're millions out there. Of course, there's gonna be transmission, but what we want to avoid is super spreading events. Super spreading events is a super spreader, someone with a lot of virus in his nose, and then a super party, super church, super family party, whatever. All these environments where contact uh, are, are unmanaged. And so here, this is not the same thing as what you're doing here. Here it's totally controlled. So here there might be a transmission tonight, okay? But it's controlled. Here it's totally uncontrolled. And the worst thing is when you have an uh, after the ski, every day during five, your five days of holidays, you repeat the same party or in Saint-Tropez, more recently, where you repeat every night and you go party every night, then if you were not infected the first night, well, you're going to become one day. And so the idea here that we need to put in our heads is that a controlled epidemic, and this is a mistake, is a controlled transmission. We need to act upon transmission. And then while we work on transmission, we need to mitigate the impact of, of this disease on health and on public health, avoid severe disease, uh, massive hospitalizations, avoid saturation of the first line, the GPs, of labs, avoid long-term consequences of infection. What if people who were, had their first asymptomatic infection actually years and years after developed cardiac problems because they had this cardiomyopathy? So be on the cautious side. Long -term, avoid long-term consequences of measures. What is the impact of what we're asking to people? All this makes the problem very complex. And so we need to go from a balance, what people name a balance, between measures and your life, and the more you put measures, the less life you have, or whatever, uh, to something which is more symbiosis. Let's, we need to learn how to live with the presence of the disease, okay, it looks populistic, but um, it is about this idea that the measures will allow you to have a normal life, because this disease is going to stay for long. And of course, there's a scary one and there's a nice one, but the leaves, they live together, and, and it's about trying to find this equilibrium where, while having this COVID not eradicated from our society, uh, we can maintain as some level of life. And so what should we do in the short term? Well, we should maintain pharmaceutical measures. There's no choice. And we should try to avoid to put them into question every time that it works. 
it worked. Okay, we don't need them anymore, it's useless. Look, if we stop doing it for a number of days, it's still fine. But no, it gives the seed for the outbreak to come back. Manage introduction of a vaccine. How bad are we going to be there? And then manage expectations. People want results directly. And then, in the meanwhile, we need to continue preparing for the other diseases. We need to not, discover, not to have 80 antivirals for five diseases. We need to have a, a, an antiviral for every family of disease. And this is what we're working at now, for the moment, in our research institute. We screen more than a, a, a million six hundred thousand molecules to find an anti-coronavirus, may it be SARS-CoV-1, 2 or 5, uh, a drug which will allow us to respond directly. And we're getting there. Uh, developed vaccine technologies which will allow us to put solutions of uh, put vaccination faster on the market. We're doing it very fast now, but it has to be faster and it has to be accessible. If we develop these vaccine technologies now with the push that we have, they should become free for everybody. This is the tools that everybody should be able to use. We've also understood that international cooperation is a huge issue here. Uh, we need to learn how to do that even better. And then we also need, and this is beyond infectious disease, how do we integrate the fact that we uh, work on health issues while not only focusing on the human body or the pathogen, but of the person living in an environment, in a society, with its particular needs. So I will stop here because time is over. Um, but I'm very happy to take uh, a few questions if, if you have. Thank you.